Um, I'm Amanda Mao from Accurate, together with my co-host Stephen Inglis and Blair Hask. We say massive welcome to the Asia Pacific MedConf Network Cotley Zoom meeting. Welcome to non-Asia Asia Pacific guests too, if there are any. Um, in this one hour, roughly the first half hour is presentation Q&A, and the second half hour is networking, the usual thing we do. The recording will be for the presentation part, although you hear the recording, but we will edit the part that we will not upload, and we'll only upload to our YouTube channel the presentation part. Networking will not be recorded. Now, let me introduce today's speakers. Michelle Ying is Business Development Manager at IQVIA Biotech Australia. Zheng Liu is Director, Quantitative Clinical Pharmacology Lead at IQVIA. Zheng has more than 10 years of experience in pharmacokinetic modeling and simulation, having worked in Australia, New Zealand, Europe, and US. He oversees all aspects of quantitative clinical pharmacology across the IQVIA portfolio. John obtained Doctor of Science at Alto University in Finland. Now, let's welcome Michelle to give a brief introduction about IQVIA. Then, John will deliver the main talk for today titled, Dose Optimization in Early Phase Oncology Trials. Please, both. Thanks so much, Amanda, Blair, and Stephen for inviting us to share uh, with the APMCN network today. It's a pleasure to meet you and your members uh, for both Jung and myself. We are part of the IQIA team, and IQIA is a merger of Quintiles and IMS Health. Um, considering the focus today is more on technical, I'll just pop a link uh, to our um, that describes more about the IQIA and the IQIA Biotech arm, where Jin and I work closely with uh, into the chat group after this, just in case you might be interested to find out more. Um, so um, we are both actually based in Australia. We have a huge team here. We are a team, we are part of 1,000 200 people in, Aust in Australia and New Zealand. So a uh, substantive um, group of Australians here and very keen to speak with the rest of the JPEG network. Um, so um, the reason when Amanda approached us and speak about um, what are the potential topics that we can speak about, one thing that came into mind because um, there has been a lot that has been happening across the oncology world since the FDA released their Project Optimus guidance around January early last year. Uh, we have seen a lot of questions coming in from the biotech companies and our teams has been working on a lot of uh, protocol amendment to cover some of the uh, FDA comments, uh, needing to update study designs. And Zheng uh, was a key person in our organization across JPEG, because Zheng is actually bilingual, amazingly, or maybe is it trilingual? Uh, and he was able to speak quite a lot with uh, the different key stakeholders in the different biotechs uh, working across China and Australia. So rather than taking any more of your time, I'll now pass across to Zheng um, to share the info that he has been sharing across the last year, the experience and also the insights and questions that he has been tackling across the last year, across uh, uh, those escalation and some of the guidance that came from FDA. Passing across to Zheng. Oh, hi. Thanks, thanks, everyone. First, I want to ask, uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks for your introduction, uh, Amanda and, uh, and Michelle. Uh, today, uh, my presentation topic is uh, uh, dose optimization in early phase oncology trials. Uh, this is just a brief uh, uh, introduction of myself. Uh, I was trained as a mathematical modeling specialist and I have been doing this uh, PKPD modeling over 10 years. And at this moment, uh, I'm leading the quantitative clinical pharmacology team in IQVIA. Okay, this is just my brief introduction. And now we go to the, the, the content. Uh, today, uh, we have uh, three topics in our agenda. Uh, the first one is uh, I'm going to introduce the background information of uh, those optimization in early phase oncology clinical trials. And then, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, the, the optimized dose, uh, how this optimized dose is calculated with uh, two real-world examples. 
And in the end, I'm going to uh, rise up two important notions, uh, which uh, I, 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 I identified um, in the dose optimization uh, studies once I was facing the clients. The first topic is that I'm going to introduce some background of dose optimization in early phase oncology trials. Okay. Uh, uh, you, you, you know, currently, uh, uh, currently, uh, phase, uh, I, I guess I have some noise background. Is, is this? Jeng, Jeng, do you have a baby where you are? No, I don't have. Okay. Could, My youngest wife is 12 years old. Okay. Could, could we please ask everyone else to put their uh, microphones on mute? I think there might be a child being picked up somewhere. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that, Jeng. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Let's continue. Uh, uh, you know, currently the phase one oncology studies are largely focused on uh, identifying the maximum tolerated doses or MTD based only on the uh, toxicity profile of the tested drug. Uh, the, the, more is, the more is the better concept has been widely accepted uh, when uh, cytotoxic drugs, for example, uh, chemotherapy uh, dominated the, the, the anti-cancer anti market. And you can see from uh, this graphic uh, I'm pointing out now, uh, the x-axis is the uh, dose exposure, the y-axis is the response. And you can see once we increase dose or exposure, both toxicity, the red curve, and the efficacy, the blue curve, both they increase. So th this is a typical toxicity efficacy profile for traditional uh, anti-tumor chemotherapy. And now we need to move to nowadays situation because nowadays uh, targeted therapy become more and more popular for oncology drugs. For example, kinase inhibitor, monoclonal antibody, ABC, et cetera, et cetera. And you can, you can see uh, with this, uh, this targeted therapy, toxicity efficacy profile, I show on this graphic, same thing, X axis is the dose exposure, Y axis is the response. Uh, once we in increase the dose exposure, we can see the toxicity this curve increase just as similarly as the previous one. But once we see this uh, efficacy profile, if we increase the dose exposure, the efficacy will increase at the beginning. After a while, it flats out. So it means that uh, after some point, if we keep increasing the dose or exposure of the drug, the efficacy won't increase significantly. So as a comparison, this uh, profile is very different from the previous chemotherapy uh, profile. So if you can see, I can show you once again, this is the chemotherapy the profile, and this is the targeted therapy profile. So this profile change is the fundamental or the scientific, uh, fu uh, scientific uh, foundation that uh, uh, now once we do uh, early phase oncology trials, we need to target on uh, optimized dose, not anymore the maximized dose. So according to what I just mentioned, uh, FDA uh, has been promoting like two years ago, promoting the concept of uh, dose optimization in early phase oncology studies, uh, considering both toxicity and efficacy. One, uh, we need to identify the ap applicable dose for the follow-up clinical trials. And uh, in January of this year, FDA published the first dose optimization guideline or white paper. And uh, the concept of uh, dose optimization in early phase oncology study uh, has become compulsory. Uh, although FDA uh, give this concept as a suggestion, but uh, in fact, it is compulsory because if uh, the sponsor wouldn't follow this uh, a dose optimization concept, then it is possible that uh, FDA could post the clinical trial. And also I want to make one notice here. The concept, uh, the concept of dose optimization has been used uh, 
very widely for decades in non-oncology studies because uh, most of the non-oncology drugs, they are targeted uh, therapies. And the concept of uh, dose optimization in oncology targeted therapy is very, very much the same as in non-oncology field. So all what we need to do is just to borrow an old concept to a new field. So this is the this is the this is some uh, some uh, background of this uh, dose optimization concept. Okay, uh, next I'm going to uh, introduce uh, this uh, how we calculate or how we identify the optimized dose uh, through two real world examples. Okay, this is the this example number one is how we can identify the optimized dose. Uh, to be used in phase two by modeling simulation method based on the phase one PKPD data. So it means that after we finish the phase one, we get the clinical trial data, we have uh, uh, PK exposure data, we have, we have uh, PD data, and we have toxicity data. How we use this data uh, to identify and optimize those, which will be used for phase two clinical trial. Uh, but this those optimization modular exercise uh, usually uh, it, uh, is conducted with exposure response modeling analysis. And this example actually I, I found from, uh, from FDA clinical pharmacology review report, because I want to show that how FDA is conducting the dose optimization calculation. Uh, some basic uh, information of uh, this compound is presented here. Yes. Uh, okay, so this is the this is the uh, case one uh, the the which is the phase one data. What I want to show you is that in this phase one clinical uh, study, we have uh, five different doses: 100, 200, 400, 800, one hundred, two hundred, four hundred, eight hundred, one thousand six hundred milligram BID. So five different doses, and uh, the safety result shows that uh, none of the doses we observe significant. Uh, um, MTD or very serious uh, uh, adverse effect. So this is the safety result. But once we see the efficacy result, you can see from this graphic, uh, the x-axis is the PK exposure of the drug in question, and the y-axis is a PD biomarker, uh, which describing the efficacy of the drug. Uh, for this drug, uh, the lower uh, these, uh, these values, uh, the better the efficacy is. And we can see once we increase uh, the dose or exposure from 100 to 400 to 800, the efficacy is getting better. But we can also see that uh, once we use 800 or 1,600 milligram as the dose, then uh, we wouldn't see so much different in efficacy. So this is the result we observed from uh, phase one uh, for safety and efficacy. Based on these two results, FDA concluded that uh, because <clears throat> uh, for safety, we, observe, we, we didn't observe uh, too much uh, uh, significant adverse effect. So from safety perspective, all these five different doses and the accord according exposures, they provide, provide similar safety profiles. But for efficacy, uh, we can see that uh, after we increase the dose from 800 uh, until 800, if we increase the dose up to 1,600, we couldn't observe too much uh, efficacy improvement. So based on this, uh, these uh, results, FDA concluded that uh, we will need to choose 800 milligram as the optimized dose for running the phase two, phase two clinical trial. Uh, the, the, lo the logic behind it is uh, pretty straightforward because, uh, because uh, mm, 800 and uh, 1,600 milligram dose, they provide similar efficacy, but the safety profile is rather similar. So once uh, both, both doses, 800 and 1,600, they provide similar efficacy, then we should always choose the lower dose because we believe that the lower dose uh, will have better safety profile. And this is uh, specifically useful uh, because uh, most of the targeted therapy, uh, they will need to be used for a long run, like uh, 
of, uh, they, they can be used uh, like one month or several months, even several years. So if we can, we should always choose the lower dose as long as the efficacy performance is similar with the higher dose. So this is my, my case, case number one. And uh, then uh, uh, let's have a look uh, the case number two. This, this case is, is an example how to identify the optimized dose to be used in phase three uh, by modeling the phase one and the phase two PKPD data. Because uh, <clears throat> this case is after phase one and two clinical trial, uh, they are finished. How we use the PKPD data from these two clinical trials to identify and optimize those which will be used in phase, phase three. Uh, this, act, this dose optimization exercise is similar with case one. Uh, in terms of uh, the way of calculating the optimized dose. And some again, some basic information of, uh, of the compound is presented here. By the way, this example is also uh, I found from the FDA Clinical Pharmacology Review Report. Okay. Uh, the result from this uh, phase one and two data I present here, the way I present is also similar as the pre previous example. First, uh, we can see in this, uh, in this uh, phase one plus phase two uh, clinical trials, we have tested uh, five different doses, which is 20, 40, 80, 160, and uh, uh, 240 milligram. And we can see uh, the, 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 the biomarker describing the drug efficacy they use here is the uh, observed response rate. And we can also see even from these numbers, um, the response rate is uh, around 50 to 60. So it means that uh, crossing all these different doses and the exposures, uh, the efficacy of the drug is quite similar. And you can see uh, we uh, summarized this table into this graphic. Uh, this graphic, we actually did the uh, regression from the uh, PK exposure and the efficacy data and we, we, we get this graphic. By the way, this graphic is the result of our modeling and simulation exercise. And we can see from this graphic that uh, crossing different dose or exposure, the efficacy actually, they look similar. By the way, I'm not sure if you can see the p-value of this, this graphic is larger than 0 0.05, which statistically means that uh, the different dose or exposures provide a similar efficacy, okay? And then uh, we see the safety profile. Uh, the graphic on the top is, uh, is the x-axis is, uh, is PK, the, the drug PK exposure, and y is rash, the, the rash, the side effect of the drug. And uh, uh, the lower the graphic is the, the x-axis is the P, uh, drug exposure, and the y is the diarrhea. Now you can see quite clearly that uh, once we increase the dose or exposure, both the toxicity performance is getting worse because more patients, they get either rush or, or, or diarrhea. So this is the result of, uh, of this phase one and the two data. Based on this result, uh, FDA concluded that uh, because in, term of, in terms of uh, efficacy, uh, different doses provide a similar, provide similar efficacy. Uh, but uh, for safety, if we increase the exposure or dose, the safety performance is getting worse. So based on the, the result I presented, uh, the FDA concluded that uh, 80 milligram, 80 milligram here in the middle, this is the optimized dose to be used to run the follow-up phase three. Yeah, actually, the, the logic is, all, is also similar as in example one. Uh, if we have a similar efficacy, uh, we should always choose uh, the lower dose. In this case, it, the 80 milligram is selected as the optimized dose. And uh, my last topic will be that uh, uh, I want to introduce uh, two important uh, notions uh, once I face the clients, once we discuss about this uh, Optim uh, dose optimization. Mm, the first uh, concept I want to introduce that uh, uh, dose optimization, if we want to identify the optimized dose 
we need to keep in mind that uh, this is a continuous process. Uh, it's not something that, it's not a matter that, uh, for example, after we finish the phase one, then we can calculate the optimized dose. And then this case is done. We will never do this again. It, it, it is not the case. So I, I can provide some example here. In fact, uh, the dose optimization um, pr pr process starts already right after the uh, preclinical pre trial is finished. Once we have the preclinical data, we should use the preclinical data, for example, including PK, PD, safety, or efficacy. We should use this uh, preclinical data to identify the optimized dose for the first in human phase one clinical trial. So this is the right after the uh, preclinical trial is finished. And after we finished phase one, we need to use the phase one, uh, phase one clinical data to identify what is the optimized dose we run in phase two, just as my first case, case, case study, case number one. And then after we finish phase two, we have the PKPD data, toxicity, efficacy data uh, from phase one and phase two. We should combine these data to identify and optimize those once again in order to run uh, phase three. So as you can see, this uh, identification of the optimized dose is a continuous process. Even after the drug is pop, uh, is uh, how to say is uh, already accepted on the market, we will need to collect the real world data in order to update the optimized dose in order to optimize the, the, the application of the drug. So it is really a continuous process since the preclinical uh, preclinical trial. Uh, all the way to uh, post market. So this is the first concept. And uh, another important concept I want to introduce here is that uh, uh, I want to emphasize the optimized dose is always for one specific tumor type. This is because uh, different tumor type, the drug mechanism of action will be different. So in this case, before we can identify and optimize the optimized dose, we will always need to identify what is the most promising tumor type for the drug in question. Only we are clear about uh, the selected tumor indication, then we can continue um, the process to identify the optimized dose, specifically for the selected tumor indication. Uh, as, as I show in, in, in this graphic, uh, for example, uh, in this phase 1A, usually in this phase 1A, uh, uh, we recruit uh, the patients with a mixture of tumor types. And after phase 1A, uh, if we can identify already uh, which tumor type is the most promising one that our drug will be used for, if we are clear with that, then we can start doing the dose optimization in phase 1B or in, in the phase 1 expansion expansion trial. So we can, it means that after phase 1B, uh, we can identify our optimized dose already. But uh, uh, on the other hand, if after phase 1A, we cannot be sure uh, which tumor type uh, our drug is targeting, then we have to use phase 1B or the expansion of phase 1. Phase one. Uh, we need to use the phase 1B uh, as an opportunity to identify what is the most promising tumor type our drug is targeting? So it means that uh, we cannot yet identify and optimize those in phase 1B. So let's say after phase 1B, uh, after phase 1A and phase 1B, we have a dose escalation and the dose expansion. After these two parts, mm, we are clear which is the tumor type our drug is targeting. Then at the moment, we can start identifying the optimized dose, which is phase two. So it means that uh, we can identify uh, the optimized dose in phase two. So this is a, a quite a critical concept. Uh, I think we should pay, pay some attention once we do the uh, uh, optimized dose calculation. Uh, because there's quite a few clients, they want me to calculate the optimized dose um, for a number of uh, tumor types or a mixture of tumor types which is, uh, which is uh, uh, not possible. And uh, also I understand that uh, 
in our audience, uh, many of you are from uh, from uh, medical writing part, and it could be worthwhile to pay attention once you write a protocol. Uh, we should write in order that we first identify what is the tumor indication for this drug, the most promising one, and then we identify and optimize those, not the other way around. Okay, so this is the, I believe this is the, oh yeah, this is a summary. Uh, as a summary of my presentation, the first one is that uh, it is kind of compulsory to identify and uh, utilize the optimized dose in early phase targeted therapy oncology clinical trials. This is number one. And then uh, I believe the, the background knowledge of uh, dose optimization uh, could be useful for our medical writers when we prepare the protocol or clinical study report. And uh, uh, the third point I want to say is that uh, modeling and simulation is the most common method uh, which is used to identify and optimize the dose. And uh, then, uh, as I just mentioned in the, a, few, a few minutes before, once we have two doses providing similar efficacy, the lower dose should be always selected as the optimized dose due to its uh, less toxicity. And uh, then uh, I want to repeat once again that the dose optimization is a continuous process as we just discussed. And uh, the last one is, is that uh, the optimized dose is for one specific tumor type. It's not for the mixture of tumor types. Okay, I guess this is my, my last, uh, last uh, uh, slide. I guess now uh, we can open the floor for, for some uh, Q&A. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Yang. Uh, so uh, that was really uh, interesting. Uh, does anybody have any, any questions that they'd like to ask? I see we've, we've got one. Uh, come through the chat. Maybe, Jen, can you uh, stop sharing so that we can see oh. more? Yeah. 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 I stopped sharing already. So the, the question that's come through on the chat is about yeah. circulating tumor DNA and becoming a, a useful tool as a surrogate endpoint for monitoring response in oncology trials with quick turnaround times that is non-invasive. So do you have any, any thoughts on that, Zhang, about um, whether that might be something? I think I think the underlying question there, which is something that I was kind of thinking about with uh, reference to, I guess, what you're saying is that in the past, we would look at chemotherapy and you just kind of presumed that you try and put as much chemotherapy in as possible to get a response. Whereas is there an element now of looking for a pharmacodynamic response at the same time as, as looking at the pharmacokinetics of the dosing to see some sort of a any sort of marker that gives you that kind of that early idea of uh, that dose optimization. You know, if you're hitting a certain point where you're getting a um a, a sort of a maximum pharmacodynamic effect, does is that playing into some of that dose op optimization that's that's going on? Yeah, uh, from this question, uh, I believe. Uh, I believe that this uh, ctDNA uh, is considered as uh, one kind of the uh, PD biomarker describing the drug efficacy. As long as the, um, this biomarker can describe the efficacy rather reasonably, then the, 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 at least the regulators, they will accept uh, this, uh, this uh, ctDNA uh, as the biomarker to represent uh, the efficacy. And uh, then, accordingly, we can use this uh, ctDNA um, to identify and op optimize those. I wouldn't see uh, big major problems of using this as long as this is a rather reliable PD biomarker to describe to describe the efficacy. But we always need to um, keep in mind that uh, there's always a, back, a gap or a big gap between the early phase biomarkers and the, the how to say, the late phase. Uh, how to say the efficacy, for example, um, overall response rate, uh, progression uh, free uh, uh, PFS, the survival rate, progression free survival rate. So we, we need to always be cautious once we use uh, this kind of uh, surrogate or PD biomarkers to describe the, the, the drug efficacy. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. And then uh, I think um, Alice has got a good question there about you know, how common is it to see 
dose optimization occurring mm. at a very late stage. And I guess mm. one thing I'd like to to possibly add on to that, do you, do you is that do you have any examples of where the dosing is is differing between different types of tumors? Uh, yes, actually, I cannot recall the, the drug name, but I did see I did see twice that uh, for non cell small lung cancer the dose was something and then for for another another tumor i couldn't remember the name even mm -hmm. the dose was different mm. so this is uh, uh at least from my experience i saw that mm -hmm. mm. and, and just yeah go back to, to alice's question as well is is do, are you aware of, of sort of instances where the the dosing has been adjusted based on post-marketing data yes this i'm, I'm I, I know because uh, uh, the reason FDA um, started promoting this uh, dose optimization optimization concept was because uh, FDA observed uh, so frequently that uh, after uh, the drug was released to the market, and then they realized the dose was not optimized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, usually it's too high because the, the toxicity was too strong. And then mm -hmm. the FDA based on the real world data after, after go to the market, they they decrease the dose. This this was kind of the driving force to push FDA to to promote this dose optimization concept. Hmm. Sort of, I guess that starts taking me down the route of how do they how do they know that that it's too high and and that that toxicity and then that the, then they might still get the same efficacy hmm. um, at a lower dose without the toxicity. But that's, I guess, going off on a bit of a tangent. I don't know if anybody else has any particular questions or we can look to move into, into some breakout rooms and have just a, a more general discussion. Uh, I've got some questions, if that's all right. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah just, just a short uh, um, um, answer to Blair. Because uh, even after post-marketing, there's still safety data being collected so mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. yeah, they will know. Um, so, yeah, just, yeah. From my memory... More than five drugs uh, accepted already uh, to the market, and then the FDA realized that the dose was too high, and mm -hmm. so this became a common phenomenon for, for those drugs. So then FDA started thinking, why is that? Okay, and then they promoted this dose optimization concept. Yeah, Steve. Um, yeah, thanks, Sheng. Um, so my questions are around first in human studies. So. I assume um, that, I mean, you've talked here about phase one studies in patients with cancer and um, for presumably it's essential still that first in human studies are done with these drugs in healthy volunteers. Um, so my, my first question is, can you please confirm that's the case and then um, as a follow-up to that, is there what is the minimum data required still from those first in human studies before you proceed to phase one trials in patients? Um, and then are there any other kind of key differences or similarities in the dose response stuff that you've described, the um, efficacy and toxicity? profiling do they do that kind of stuff as well in other therapy areas and is there any any similarities or differences could you please repeat your first question at least the first part because uh, there's some breakdown once you you, okay. you, were, you were saying that. so what is the minimum that that is like you have um you do the first in human studies first before you put them in patients so that's my first question is that true and then what is the minimum um, requirement from those studies before you then actually test them in patients with cancer in a phase one study? Mm. Uh, from my experience, usually these anti-tumor drugs, uh, it's not so common we test uh, with the health volunteers. Mm -hmm. that's, my, that's my first impression. Usually- And, 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 yeah, yeah, and adding on to Jim. Yeah, so um, sorry, I didn't introduce myself initially. Um, prior to uh, being uh, IQBS, uh, 
business development uh, manager. I used to work in project management for a good 10 years, mostly in oncology studies, so phase one, two, three studies. So uh, to answer um, uh, Stephen's questions, majority, usually for the oncology phase one studies, because one, uh, previously we had done a lot of work in chemotherapy, right? And these are toxic. It has always gone into a patient. Usually in the phase one, it's usually all common solid tumors. So or all commas, um, where it's uh, cancer patients cause. And this would have failed several lines of therapy because one, in the traditional days, the um, drugs are toxic. So then they can only be given to patients which are then oncology patients. So rarely, I've not seen a case where we would go into a normal healthy volunteer because they probably wouldn't react well to something that's quite toxic. Um, so that's uh, uh, adding on to genes. Mm. Is that the case with modern treatments with targeted therapies as well, Michelle? So in even in the immunology setting, even with the CAR T's, right, we are all seeing them going into oncology patients. Okay. I will have to dig real hard and check back with my team to find one that uh, would have gone into a healthy. Mm. Okay, that's really interesting. Thank you. At least from my memory, I didn't see any anti-tumor drugs tested in, in, in health volunteers. Not yet. Maybe soon it will come. Now, maybe when the treatment gets less toxic. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Then, Stephen, second part of your question. Sorry, I missed that too. Mm. Uh, that was like, uh, are there any key differences or similarities in dose optimization versus tox toxicity versus dose um, for um, other therapy areas out other than cancer? Okay. Okay. Let me pick up this question. Uh, in terms of the calculation method, to calculate the optimized dose in non-oncology field and oncology field, the calculation method, I would say, is exactly the same. Exactly the same modeling and simulation method, which will be used to identify the optimized dose in these two fields. So from a um, mathematical calculation method perspective, they are the same. That's why we can very easily uh, borrow the non-oncology uh, calculation method to identify the optimized dose optimize those to oncology. 